Hello, welcome to IMM. We've just put the final touches to a scene for the Gospel of John in our series Open the New Testament. And this seems as good a place as any to talk about costumes for Bible stories. Hollywood movies, church dramas, children's picture books are just three areas of our cultural life where we're used to seeing people dressed as characters from Bible times. Now, three questions may come to mind. The first is, is what I'm seeing really accurate? The second is, how can I get the right look for my production? And the third is, how can I do all that on a very low budget? Well, let me explain. This interpretation of the parable of the kings at war in Luke 14 shows metal armor and weapons, historically accurate and expensive. And the set is a reproduction of a Greek house of the second century BC. But in this scene, the soldiers in the army of King Herod in the first century BC are in plastic armor and weapons, and it's been shot out of doors, so there's nothing very costly here. The first question is what are we trying to achieve? Presenting a Christmas play in a church is not the same thing as illustrating an article for an academic journal on clothing in the Roman Empire. But even a Christmas play should, if possible, have the right look historically. But it also has to meet expectations in the audience that are based on a long tradition of Christian art, from stained glass windows, classical paintings and even Christmas cards. In this program, I'm going to show you some of the options, comment on them from a historical point of view, and show you how to make some of them on a fairly low budget and still get a look that's acceptable to most audiences. We've divided all this into chapters. And the first of them is on Jewish men, so we'll see you in a few moments. What people usually think of as typical biblical costume for Israelites in the Old Testament and for Jewish people in the New Testament is largely, I believe, a creation of the imagination based on Arab costume in the late 19th century. Let me explain. In the Middle Ages, biblical characters were shown in medieval European costume. From the time of the Renaissance to the Victorian era, artists in Europe seem to have based biblical scenes and costume on whatever they could learn of ancient Greece and Rome, and sometimes the Jewish minorities living among them. But in the late 19th century and early 20th, things started to change. Travelers began to visit the Middle East, especially the land of Palestine, which was part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Artists who traveled soon realized that the Middle East was very different from anything seen in Western art. The wise men coming to Jerusalem by James Tiso showed a real camel caravan in the desert of Judea. The Sermon on the Mount by William Hull showed what he believed was the very spot where Jesus taught. Like James Tiso, William Hull showed Bible stories in the real landscape and costumes he saw in Palestine, combined with some of the new information from archaeology. Harold Copping's paintings became popular prints in Sunday school classrooms and people's homes. The paintings by these artists had a huge impact. Hollywood film directors followed their lead. And now this is what people expect. Accurate or not, it has created a tradition of how Bible scenes are represented in the media. It's what I call the traditional look. From October 2009 to January 2010, the Brooklyn Museum in New York staged an exhibition of 350 paintings on the life of Christ by James Tiso. Let me show you one of them. This is the 
healing of the leper uh, by Jesus. Beautiful painting, full of drama. But the buildings in this and the costumes were all from the late 1800s in Palestine, which is what James Tiso saw when he went there. I greatly treasure my volume of prints of the paintings, 80 pictures by William Ho. This book is over a hundred years old. Now oh, here's a nice one. This is Jesus blessing the children in Jerusalem. A lovely picture. Here's a New Testament. It's got illustrations by Harold Copping. This is an illustration of St. Paul being lowered down the wall in Damascus, sitting in a basket. Pictures like this by Harold Copping and others shaped the mental images the people had of the New Testament. Let me show you another one by Harold Copping. Now, this is a favourite of mine. This is the healing of the blind man at the Pool of Siloam in John chapter 9. But look at the costumes. The costumes are Arab costumes from Palestine from the late 1800s or the early 1900s. So, here is what people think of as biblical costume for a man. And it's based on Arab costume. First, a long sleeve robe. In Arabic, this is called a dishdasha. It's also called a thorb. Then, an outer robe. The outer robe is called a bisht. This one, by the way, is the real thing from Palestine and probably not later than the early 1900s. It's a really old one and very, very nice. And then their headscarf, which is called a kafia, plural, the plural is kafiyat, and this was held in place by an agal, which is a coil made out of goat's hair. But is this correct for biblical costume? There's no doubt that Arab countries at the end of the 19th century were very conservative and their costume had its origins in the ancient world. But that does not mean that the Jews of the first century looked like 19th century Arabs. The pattern on this headscarf, which is the same as the one worn by our model, is in black and white and is typically Palestinian. This one, which is in red and white, is typically Jordanian. Neither of these really represent Bible times. And I think we could say the same about the goat's hair agal on his head. On the other hand, for people working in the fields, a protection from the sun was important and something similar may have been used in Bible times and almost certainly was used. Other head coverings mentioned in the Bible include the turban. And although the turban was mentioned in scripture, there's no archaeological evidence from the New Testament period that this was used, so we just don't know. Another was the cap worn through many centuries in the Middle East. Was it worn in biblical times? Almost certainly. If you want to get this look, I would suggest that the inner tunic should be not pure white, but a beige or a cream color. If you rinse it in tea or coffee a few times, no milk please, it will tone down and get slightly uneven color, which will make it look more natural. Or you could use a white cotton and rinse it in a beige dye, but use more fabric by weight than the instructions say, and this will dilute the effects and get a slightly uneven and patchy look, which will actually improve it. Now, let me talk about the headscarf here. Let's take for a moment, this is my friend Marin, who is standing in as a model for us today. I'm going to take off the agal and the kafiya, and I'm going to put on a turban. This one's had the outside already stuck to it. So we'll put the turban on you, the marine. Is this good enough? Yeah, that'll fit. Now I'll take a typical square cloth. It's got a fringe on. And I'll fold that cloth in two diagonally like that and drape that across his head. And there is what many people in the traditional look think of as a, a Bible character. 
For the cloak or outer robe, we need to get a fabric that is heavy and has a rough, natural look to it. Gwen from our costume department is going to help me with this. Now, when you want to make a bisht, please don't use either a brightly coloured piece of cloth or a heavily striped one, but get something that has a natural look and is fairly heavy. This is almost a felt look. Find the middle point. There it is, and a mark will be made. And we've made a mark already. Fold it across, leaving a gap for the back of the neck. There it's hanging, it's taking shape already. Sew across here, just use a loop, sew it across, make an opening with scissors or a sharp knife, about 12 inches or so long down here for the sleeves to come through, and there you've got the outer garment, known as the bisht. Thanks, Gwen. There's a great deal of variety of costume you can get with this. Using a fleecy fabric, you can make it look more uneven by cropping it with scissors and then a bit of spray paint under the armpits and around the neck. Now, this is one I did a little while back. This is an imitation fleece. Made that shape. Black spray paint around the arms, back of the neck, on the seat where he would be sitting, around the bottom hem and in other places where it would be naturally soiled and it looks like a shepherd who's been on heavy duty with his flock. Another suitable one. This is a roughish look that would be for a fairly poor man. We made that up out of an old army blanket. And then another, which is very nice. We took some uh, heavy woolish type material and added a bit of decoration down the front and you have a lovely garment for a rich man and we've even added a slight sleeve on the edge as you can see. So this is the outer garment over the inner tunic. And here's another one that looked very suitable for a Pharisee we felt. And it's dark and conservative and heavy and we've added a little bit of braid again but of a conservative kind. Making something similar from felt we came up with a costume for the prodigal son. In the story of the Good Samaritan we made a bisht garment, and this time there were stripes in the cloth, but they're not bright. And we added a cap and turban that were in the same palette colour-wise. If you were doing a costume for Jesus using this approach, you could start with a typical dish dasher, a long-sleeved tunic, then add a pale-coloured bisht, and then finally a head shawl of a pale colour too. And this is the approach that has been used by many movies and television programmes in portraying Christ. It's perfectly legitimate if you want to keep within the uh, traditional approach that's been established by artists like Tissot and Copping. But there is another whole approach to this, based not on a traditional look from Palestine, but on historical research. And that's what we will look at in the next chapter. Let's take a different approach to Jewish men's costume, more historical. From archaeological excavations near the Dead Sea, there are some fragments of clothing that date fairly close to the New Testament. And equally important, from the early 3rd century, there are wall paintings on a synagogue in Dura Europos in Syria. And these show something rather different. The tunic was white or off-white, a simple design with elbow-length sleeves. Over the shoulders were dark stripes. The Jews called these stripes the Imra. The Romans called it the Clavus, but we'll deal with that later. In this case, we made the stripe over the shoulders just by sewing on a length of black or dark brown bias binding. The basic shape for tunics, Roman or Jewish, could be a T-shape, as you see here, fairly obvious, or it could be simply a rectangle, a rectangular piece of cloth folded over the shoulders with a, an opening made on the side for the arm to come through and a, an opening, of course, on the top for the neck. 
And so when this was, if this is wide enough, when it drapes over the shoulders, it falls down the top of the arm like a sleeve. Now, it could be made of one piece of cloth, but it could also be made from two pieces of cloth, front and back, joined together. When it was belted, it looked like this. We have usually made a boat-shaped neck. When the tunic was made of two pieces of cloth, back and front, joined together with a seam down the shoulder, then for the Jews this had a special advantage, because if one part of the tunic, let's say the front, became ceremonially unclean and had to be removed, the other half, let's say the back, was still ritually clean and could be joined with a new piece of cloth to make a new garment. In John 19, verse 23, we read that the tunic worn by Jesus was made of one piece of cloth without a seam, meaning a seam on the shoulder. This made it very valuable. When we did our series on parables of Jesus and the path of Jesus, the actor portraying Jesus wore this tunic. And um, it has no seam on the shoulder and just down the sides. And this is what made it so very valuable. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the robbers on the road to Jericho stole the clothes of the Jewish traveler. In the ancient world, yarn had to be spun by hand and cloth was woven by hand. So clothing was very expensive and even second-hand clothes could be sold in the market for a good price. The Greek word in the New Testament for cloak was hematium. So now Gwen is going to help me again. If you take that end of it, Gwen, I'll take this end and we're going to put this on Marine here over the left shoulder. That's about right. Under the right arm and over the left arm again. There we are. That's about the way it looks on the painting, I think. So, the cloth is about three and a half yards or three and a half meters long. And for this, get something that's off-white and soft and will drape well. Buying some cloth to make a cloak like this is not difficult. That's the easy part. But what about that weaver's shuttle design? I'll show you how to make it. First of all, I'll stretch out the material on a table. Now, take masking tape, just regular masking tape to use for painting the house. Good. And that I'm going to stretch and stick onto the cloth. Now, I've measured it out to give my weaver shuttle design. There it is. And I've done the whole width of the cloth with that. Now, I'm going to paint that. I take a stencil brush and I can take stencil paint like this and I can just dab that in and dab it on here. But there's another way. Instead of stencil paint, you may prefer to use proper fabric paint. Here is a little dish to mix it in. This is a textile medium such as you can find in almost any hobby shop. And we're going to pour some on there, like that. Now we need some colouring. That just, that's just to stop the paint setting hard and stiff on a cloth. It should hang loose. This is an acrylic artist's colour, but you could use pigment of almost any kind. Mix that in. Now I'm going to take my stencil brush and I'm going to mix that together. The colour will come from the paint and the softness on the cloth will come from the textile medium. And now I'm going to start painting. Not too much paint on the brush and we don't want it to run through the fibres. So here we go. In this case I've gone with a very dark brown which will have a nice natural look on the fibres. Now, if you're using textile medium like this, just let the thing dry. Don't touch it, don't smear it. 
let it dry and after two or three days it should be fine to so just peel off the paper and everything will be good. If you're using stencil paint you have to treat it rather differently. The best thing then is to let it dry for a couple of days then take paper towel and put the paper towel on an ironing board you'll need to put two layers even three, four if you want to. The idea is to stop the paint getting through to the ironing board and spoiling your ironing board. Uh, you don't want that to happen. Then put the cloth there. Now this is for stencil paint that's already dried for a couple of days. Put more paper on top. You may want to go with two or three layers and after that a hot iron and just press that evenly and what's going to happen is with stencil paint it's, it's got an oil in it and the oil and some of the colour will come up into the uh, paper that you've got above and below and then you will be able to peel off the paper uh, and you will have the design that you put on. So, you see, and so on. And then you have to do the other side. Well, I've already done the other side in this. There it is, complete all the way through. We used garments similar to these for some of the scribes in the video programs we were making. We also used this style for Jesus, but we never used pure white. Pure white will not look good on camera. And for a scene in the ancient world, a natural linen or a natural wool look is much more authentic. As this is a Jewish himatian or cloak, we need to add tassels. But first, let's clear the deck here for action. Thank you, Gwen. And if you can get that paint at the same time, wonderful. Now, here we've got one. The Jews called a cloak like this a talit. These days, a the tallit is just the prayer shawl, but that is probably a descendant from the much larger cloak of biblical times. Now, to make the tassels at the corner, first of all, we need to make a hole, and I would suggest taking a pencil or pen. I've made a hole there. Good. Now, I'm going to take the threads. There are four threads. And according to Numbers chapter 15, one of the threads should be blue. Now, you won't find that on all prayer shawls. Many of them use only white threads. But recently in Israel, they've rediscovered the dye that was used originally to make these blue threads. And they're using blue threads again, as the Torah instructs. And I've taken these threads. I put them through a bobby pin because you're going to see in a moment that makes it easier. Here are the four threads. Equal length except one of them, and that one we call a shamash, and it is about twice the length of the other. So I'm going to take this bobby pin and just push it through the hole near the garment. You see? That's now I've got my threads and can pull them through. That's just just a little trick there. Now I want to even up the ends of these. Here we go. That's evened up, and there's one long one. I'm going to take it from the side, which is here, and I'm going to tie a double knot. There we are. Now, about there. There we are. We'll get the shamash through. We've got a double knot. Now, take this shamash thread and wind it around the other threads seven times. One, two, mm -hmm. you can see I don't do this for a living. Four, When I've reached what I think is seven, I'm going to count them. 
Now we're going to take half of the threads, again four and four, and tie another double knot. After that, I take the shamash again, the long thread, and start winding again. So this time, having wound it seven times, the next time around is eight times. After that, another double knot, wind the sh uh, shamash around it, 11 times, another double knot, and 13 times, and one more double knot. And then you've got the complete tassel. So let me show you that. Here we are on this garment. It's already made. Remember, you've got to do this four times, once for each corner, and they should attach fairly much to the outside edge of the talith. So four of these, and then even off the threads at the end when you're through. And there are your tassels on the corners. By the way, the zitzit, as it's called, the ta uh, tassel for the end of the garment, is uh, something that you can look up on the web, and you'll find that different rabbis tie them in slightly different ways. We've shown you one way. There are other ways of tying these. So, now what do you show? A traditional look or a more historical look? Well, that really depends on what you're trying to achieve and who is your audience. I've deliberately blended the two, and in the video clips in this program, you'll see that. I think it works well, and I hope you will agree. Now let's look at Jewish women's costume. Again, the idea has been drawn from a traditional 19th century Palestinian peasant costume. For example, in this painting by William Hole, you see Mary and Elizabeth greeting each other. Mary is wearing the traditional Palestinian costume from Nazareth. Elizabeth is wearing the costume that is typical of southern Judea. The long-sleeved robe is called the thorb, and then there's a shawl over the head. But is this accurate? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. So, the traditional way of showing Jewish women in New Testament times is a long-sleeved dress with a sash and a large wrap over the head. In fact, this may not be so different from New Testament times. But the synagogue wall painting in Dura Europos does show women as well as men in what was the contemporary dress just after New Testament times. What it shows are several slightly different variations, but essentially the same thing. Let me show you. First, a dress with sleeves just below the elbow, and then over it a hemation with an L-shaped design at the corner. Now this is sometimes called the gamma design because it's the shape of the Greek letter gamma. Let me show you. There we are. This is confirmed by fragments of clothing from the Dead Sea of Judea. I have found that about two and a half yards Two and a half meters of material is plenty, and it will hang well. Don't skimp on material. It's not worth it. The way we have put on the gamma design is exactly the same as what we've used for the notched band on the men's costume. Put on masking tape and then paint the pattern in with a stencil brush, either with stencil paint or with fabric paint. It's also been noticed that while white or pale cloaks had the notched band design, which we saw in the men's costume, darker cloaks had the gamma design. On colours generally, I prefer to keep to earth colours that look more natural. Don't have Jewish women wear bright red. It was not considered appropriate. And it was associated with Gentile women. But a dull pink or a reddish brown would be all right, and those are seen in the Dura Europos wall painting. And on their feet, the women have black slippers. So there you have something of Jewish women's costume, either a traditional look or a look 
based on the clothing fragments found in the Dead Sea area, the wilderness of Judea, and the wall paintings in the synagogue at Dura Europos in Syria, which date, as we said before, from the early 3rd century AD. When we want to costume Jewish priests, we have information from the Old Testament and comments from the first century Jewish historian Josephus. But some of the details still remain obscure. The visible garment was a linen robe reaching the feet and the wrists. The wrists were probably bound with straps to avoid the sleeves getting in the way during rituals in the temple. The belt was a long sash with embroidery in blue, purple and red, and during sacrifice the sash was placed over the left shoulder. The headdress is a problem. It seems to have been a turban wound up very high, but over it there may have been a cover. What I have done is simply to give the height with a cap like this, and then we've made the mitre and placed that over the top of it like so. The mitre here is white cotton, but it's been rinsed down a little bit, bit in colour to give the impression of, of linen. And it's sewn into a headband around the edge with a neck covering at the back. The feet were bare. No shoes or sandals, please. Not for the priests. The high priest also had a blue robe that had ornaments sewn on the hem. These were small gold bells that made a sound when he walked, and little imitation pomegranates of blue and red and purple yarn. The opening for the neck was from the back to the front, and it was reinforced so that it couldn't tear. I'm going to give that to uh, Gwen, thanks Gwen, to take for our high priest in a moment. <laughs> Over that he wore another garment called an ephod, there have been several different attempts to interpret and replicate this, and this is just one version. The cloth should have blue, red, purple and gold thread. Was it striped? Was it embroidered with floral designs? And if so, what were they? Well, we found a material that had just the right colours in a tiny floral pattern. It hangs down the front and the back like an apron. It is tied together with a sash of the same material. Hanging on the ephod at the front was the breastplate and this was made of the same kind of cloth and was a rectangle folded in two to make a square, about 9 inches 22 centimetres on each side. On the breastplate were 12 stones in gold filigree settings representing the 12 tribes of Israel. There is debate about the identity of these stones, and you can find different opinions online. I followed the one that I thought was best. Now, how can you make a look-alike for drama? Let me show you. I got some epoxy resin uh, that can make a plastic replica jewellery. It, uh, it's a chemical process. You take the two chemicals, you mix them in equal quantities, you stir them exceedingly well, turn them into another cup, stir again, and then there are different coloured um, dyes, here's a yellow one, a red and a blue, that you can mix together to get just the colour you want. You pour that into the mould. Now before you do that you have to get a release agent, you can get this in a hobby shop, and you spray the mould so that the a chemical will not stick to the plastic. When that's complete and dried, you can then ease it out of the mould, there it comes, and you have an imitation stone. This one is a dark, dark red. The light will refract through that, be quite beautiful. If you want to have an opaque rather than a translucent stone, then just get some artist colourings like these acrylic paints, mix them up on a palette and paint over the top and you can create a pattern that you want like lapis lazuli or, or onyx. And then make some more clear resin and paint that over the top so it has the same shine and finish as it does in the one that you started with, the original.
So that's what we've done over here. Let me show you again. Here is the breastplate with the 12 stones. And then on the top, there are two onyx stones on the shoulders. Now these in the Bible would have been engraved with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Six on this shoulder, six on this, and one tribe each on the stones on the breastplate. We haven't done that because it wasn't shown in such close up. There were two gold woven chains between the shoulder stones and the top of the breastplate which had gold rings on it and at the bottom it was attached with a blue thread from the bottom of the uh, breastplate which had a gold ring to another gold ring which was sewn onto the ephod itself. So that's how we did that. Now I'm going to give this and the sash and the head band there. Thank you to Gwen and we're going to see that in a moment. So this is how we put it together and now I want you to see how the whole thing came together. I think it's rather good. So here is the high priest with all the items we've mentioned. On his forehead the high priest wore a gold plate engraved with the words holiness to the Lord. It was tied in place with a blue ribbon. Some dramas show the high priest wearing these clothes at all times, including the trial of Jesus. This is not correct. These robes were worn only on ceremonial occasions. In New Testament times, the Romans took charge of these robes and kept them locked away in the Antonia Fortress, north of the temple in Jerusalem. When we showed the high priest Caiaphas interrogating Jesus, we dressed him in a white tunic and a typical Hellenistic cloak or Hematian and wearing sandals. However, we did have him keep the priestly mitre and the blue ribbon just to remind us of who he was. The Gospel of Luke tells us that at the time of Jesus, there were two high priests, Caiaphas and Annas. Annas had been high priest years before, but now he was old and retired but he still kept the honorary title. Caiaphas, his son-in-law, was the high priest in office. So only Caiaphas could have worn the ceremonial robes, and then only on special days. Not Annas, he was in retirement. Most of the costume worn around the Mediterranean area during the New Testament period was related to the Greek culture before Christ. That Greek or Hellenistic culture influenced everywhere from Judea to Italy. In fact, when Roman men did not have to wear the official Roman toga, they preferred the more comfortable clothes of the Mediterranean world. The tunic was the pattern we've already seen. It could be either a T-shape with sleeves coming to just about the elbows or it could be a rectangular shape, larger, wider, with holes at each side for the arms to come through and a hole in the centre for the neck. Colours. Browns, greys, beige is fine, even dull reds. But when you think of a red in the Roman world, Try to think of a kind of a brick red. I call this a, a Roman red. That's more appropriate. Stripes. Yes, stripes over the shoulders, what the Jews call the imra, what the Romans call the clavus. But try to avoid purple because purple is associated with Roman official dress. So go for a, a black or a very dark brown. Actors portraying slaves as servants, I have usually put in large sleeveless tunics with a drab colour and with the tunics pulled up over a belt to give more freedom of movement. A Roman innkeeper from the story of the prodigal son wears a more colourful tunic and the prodigal himself is altogether more gaudy, totally lacking in good taste, more money than sense. When we showed the nobleman who served Herod Antipas and whose son was healed by Jesus, I put him in a tunic with a decorative stripe in the centre. According to Herodian of Antioch, 
who wrote a history in Greek during the second and third centuries. The Phoenicians, who were a people who lived in what today we call Lebanon, not so far from Galilee and Judea, wore robes with long sleeves and a single broad stripe down the center of the tunic which hung to their feet. So I have felt free to show a variety of styles, some influenced by Rome, some by Greece, and some by the Phoenicians. For example, here is a uh, tunic which has a Greek design on it and it's long-sleeved. Here is another one which has a stripe just like Herodian described down the centre. What we've done to get a nice ornamental look, we took some curtaining material and cut a stripe out of it and sewed it onto the front. The cloak, the Greek word is the hemation, was a rectangle of cloth and Gwen's going to help me here. Thank you, Gwen. This cloth is three and a half meters long, three and a half yards long, and it's a soft material that will drape beautifully. So let's put the cloak on Marine, who is our model here, over the left arm. Most of that should hang over the shoulder, but a little bit can come down to, the, to here. Now, please notice, there are weights on the corner. These were used by the Greeks. I've just got fishing weights from a fishing tackle shop, but it does the job. It helps it to hang there and not slip off the shoulder. Under the right arm, thanks, Gwen, and over the left shoulder, again gathering most of it on the shoulder, and now again you see how important that weight is because that is keeping it on the shoulder by hanging down the back and keeps it nicely draped. So that is how the stylish Greek would have turned out during the New Testament period. When we come to talk about weights and cloth for a more wealthy man, we had a brighter cloth, still within the general colour palette of the New Testament period, but brighter than normal. And we had a nice large terracotta bead from a hobby shop, so that it would look a little more ornamental on the corner, and some braid, which we sewed around the edge to look like, um, like embroidery. When we have portrayed people in different classes of society, I've tried to show this by their clothing. In the parable of the costly pearl, the rich merchant wears colourful clothing. In this case, we stenciled a pattern around the edge of his hemation and attached a length of braid. The man selling the pearl is well-dressed, but altogether more restrained. The parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18 gave us a wonderful opportunity to show some beautiful Hellenistic costumes and a rich variety of colours and decorations. Costumes like this are not difficult to make, but please try to avoid modern synthetic fabrics that look so crisp and fake for the ancient world. Keep away from very bright modern colours. Rich colours for the rich, drab colours for the poor, but nothing too cheap and bright, and I think you'll find it will work out very well. In the Roman Empire, Greek and Roman women wore much the same kind of garment. First of all, a tunic, then over that a long dress, and then finally, as we shall see, a large wrap or veil. The inner garment was a long tunic. The sleeves could be joined at points along the upper arm with gaps in between and a hole in the side through which the arms came. Or it could have long narrow sleeves. We've shown this on a lady of some rank and standing because it's made of a very fine material. A woman of lower standing in society would have a, a rougher and plainer material than this. Over that was a long dress made of wool, belted at the waist and pinned at the shoulders, with the back slightly over the front. The overlaps, hanging at the back and at the front, have small weights, or they don't in this case, but they often did have small weights at the four corners, and then it could be belted 
or it could be left to hang loose. There would also be a band of decoration around the hem. Remember that even though her dress reaches her feet, a woman in the ancient world would only appear like this in her own home. In public, she would be almost completely covered with a wrap. Roman matrons seem to have joined the back and front of the stola with a strap across the shoulders. And this may have been what they call the instita. But many women in the Mediterranean world would have joined the front and the back simply with a brooch or a pin. As we've just said, over all this was a large cloak called the hemation by the Greeks and the pala by the Romans. This cloak would always be worn in public, which is what Paul was referring to in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, Gwen from our costume department is going to help me drape this so that you can see how it goes. Thanks, Gwen. It's quite a large garment, as you can see. Over the left shoulder, virtually down to the ground, but not quite touching it, get a good lot of material at the shoulder so that it doesn't slide off the arm. And then up over the top like that. And there you have the typical Greek or Roman lady ready to go out in public. This large cloak would always be worn in public and is what Paul was referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As you can see, in the cloak, the Hematian worn by our model, there is a nice design around the edge, and that's in a kind of an olive leaf pattern. But the Greeks use various patterns. For example, here, this one is what's called the Greek key design. You can buy stencils in some shops that were, match these patterns and just use that to uh, stencil the pattern on in paint over the cloth. This is a Greek wave pattern. Another possibility is, that's an ancient Greek design is this one. I call this the palmet. I'm not sure what it's officially called. Uh, but again, it's a typical Greek pattern. Now, both of these you will find shown on Greek vases and in Greek architecture. And we know from pictures that they were also used on cloaks, both worn by men and by women. And so that's a possibility for decoration. In this shot, you see the woman at the well, and you can see all three garments, the inner tunic, the wool dress joined at the shoulders, and the large wrap. Obviously, there was a huge difference between women in high society wearing the clothes and jewelry, such as the wife of a nobleman in John chapter four, and servants working in the kitchen or peasant women in the villages. In the New Testament, when we see women, they're usually in a public setting, so they're covered with a large wrap, and you just have to use the colour and texture of the cloth to indicate their position in life. It is somewhat limiting. On the other hand, it makes your job a lot easier, and I don't think any of us will complain about that. When we talk about costume in the Roman Empire, people usually think of togas. But we must realize that most of the time, Greek and even Roman men wore the hemation, not the toga. See, the toga was a very special garment worn by relatively few people. First, it could only be worn by people who were privileged to be Roman citizens, and that was a minority in the Roman Empire. But even Roman citizens preferred not to wear the toga, and you'll see why in a moment, unless they had to. In the New Testament, Roman officials would have worn the toga when on duty, and this would have included the Roman magistrates in the Book of Acts, and possibly Pontius Pilate at the trial of Jesus, and of course, Caesar Augustus. If they had to conduct official business in the city of Rome, Citizens were required to wear the correct kind of tunic and the toga. We could say the toga was the business suit of ancient Rome, but it was much more restricted because of the requirement of citizenship. 
In New Testament scenes, we're mostly concerned with three versions of the tunic and two versions of the toga. But let's start with the tunic. The Roman citizen on official business wore a white or off-white tunic which came to just below the knee. In public, the tunic must always be belted. The toga itself was made of wool, but let me show it to you on a paper model first. It was a huge piece of cloth, 15 to 18 feet long. That's about five meters. To put it on, the oval was folded in two, thus making a semicircle. Now, in earlier years, the Romans actually wore a semicircular uh, toga, but in later times it became the oval and was folded over. I would suggest that for practical purposes in a church play, this is so big that you could actually use a semicircle. Years ago, some scholars thought the toga was this shape in the first century, so perhaps historians will forgive me. Now, let me show you how this drapes. Gwen is going to help me. It usually took one or two slaves to get the toga on the Roman citizen anyway, so here we are, we're the slaves. Um, here's the toga, and here's how we're going to do it. Now, I'm going to just change places with Gwen for a moment. You would take that one. The straight edge over the shoulder, this straight edge, the, the curve is on the outer edge here, has got to hit the floor, a little fold there. We'll, you'll see why later about that. Arm up here, thank you, Maureen, that's very good. Under the right arm, keeping the straight edge near the top, the curved edge at the bottom, over the left shoulder, Again, mm, yes, about there. Now, we take that first layer, that's the straight edge that came in at the beginning, that came down to the floor, and we pull that up and hang it over the, the fold in the toga, making what was called the umbo. That was called the umbo, the lower part on that side called the sinus. If a Roman man belonged to the equites, the social class of knights, he had a narrow purple stripe called Angustus Clavus over the shoulders, about one and a half inches wide, about three centimeters. The toga for a knight was still the plain toga virilis, but if he was a patrician, a member of the hugely wealthy Roman aristocracy, then he wore a tunic with the latus clavus, a broad purple stripe over the shoulders, this time about three inches, six centimeters wide. When we say purple in the Roman Empire, it was most likely not exactly halfway between red and blue, what we call purple. It was probably a, a reddish purple color, something like a burgundy. The toga for the senior magistrates, which in practice meant many of the patricians who were also senators, was the toga praetexta which had a broad purple stripe along the edge. Remember, the toga was not worn with sandals. I mean, can you imagine a business suit, white shirt and silk tie with sandals? <laughs> the toga was worn with a special kind of boot called the calcius, and we'll talk about that later. When we shot scenes of Pontius Pilate, I faced a bit of a problem. Should we put him in military dress or wearing a toga? I decided on the toga. Since Pilate was a knight, he would have worn the narrow stripe on his tunic. But what about the toga? Pilate was a magistrate, but did this entitle him to the toga praetexta? I don't know. And when I asked the leading authorities, I got no answer. So since the question was open for me, the decision was made on the basis of what would look best dramatically, and that was clearly the toga praetexta. Augustus wore the tunic with wide clavi over the shoulders and the toga praetexta, like any other leading magistrate. And the Roman historian Suetonius says that the stripes of Augustus's clothing were neither narrower nor wider than normal. Most people want to dress the Roman emperors in purple. Well, there's no question that later emperors did wear purple, but generally, 
Caesar Augustus did not. He was trying to make a political statement that he saw himself as princeps, which meant first citizen. What about footwear? Well, let me show you several types. Now, the names I'm going to use will be Latin, but that's simply because there are no English words to distinguish between some of the different styles. In much of the Roman Empire, especially in the Western Empire, a popular form of shoe was the carbatina. The plural is carbatinae. This was made from a single piece of leather. Round the toe, it was cut into slats, and in each one, a small hole where a leather thread could be pushed through. On the sides of the foot, it was cut into loops with elongated holes. At the back, it was cut in this shape to go around the heel, and with very small holes just here. These could then be folded up, and threaded together, as you see in this shoe. Then, from the front, we take the threads, which have been put through those holes, and we pull them together, so, and we've created a toe. Then, the we tie a knot, so that bit doesn't come undone, and the remaining part of the uh, threads go through these uh, holes, the in the side of the shoe and tie up around the front. As you can see, these are not difficult to make if you have the basic skills and you can get the tools and leather from a craft shop. Another form of footwear was the crepida. The plural is crepidae. Unlike the carbatina, the crepida had loops on the side but it had a sole on the bottom then loops and was threaded across the top with uh, leather thongs. I think that probably the crepida was the most widely used form of footwear in the New Testament world. This is a version for ladies and uh, here's another version. Now this looks very much like carbatina but it's not because it has a sole. It's not just one piece of leather and it has these loops around the edge and then laced over the top. There are two words for sandals, soliae and sandalia, and they could describe different forms. Some were similar to what we call flip-flops. Sandals from the New Testament period have been discovered in the Dead Sea area and are just a sole of leather with a couple of thongs to hold it onto the foot. Now, getting accurate replicas of all this can be expensive, but it's possible to buy modern sandals that have more or less the right look, such as some of these. And with some skill, it's possible to make them. Let me show you some examples we've got here. Uh, I think the side and the front of it is just fine, but if we show the back, that lacing together at the back is something I've not seen uh, on a sandal from the New Testament period. This, on the other hand, is a replica of a Greek period sandal and it works very nicely, as you can see there, but that is a lot more expensive. Uh, the sandals worn by the Roman army had a special name, Caliga, and they were different again. The loops in the Caliga worn by the soldiers were very narrow. You can see how narrow that loop is and they had many of these loops along the side and then up the ankle. And they again were laced together tightly with a leather thong. For the Roman citizen wearing a toga, there was a special kind of soft leather boot called the calcius. Calcius is a Latin word for which we have no exact equivalent in English. The plural of calcius is calcae.
For patricians, which means many of the senators and all of the senior magistrates, we know that red was involved. But was it a red boot with black straps or a white boot with red straps or what? I've chosen a red boot with black straps. But how do you do this on a low budget? I was able to purchase some suede moccasins. They're quite cheap. They're made of inexpensive materials. I removed the uh, thongs from the centre, opened up these seams and painted them red. Then having got them red, the right colour, I took black straps, which were simply vinyl, cut them out, stuck them on each side and then reinforced that with stitching. Now, how are we going to put that on the foot? Let me show you. Doing up the straps on the calceus is a little bit complicated, so let me show you. We've got four straps, two at the back, two at the front. We take the front ones first. First of all, let's get that boot as smooth as possible. Take the front strap across and the, notice the outside over the inside strap. Around the back of the foot, around to the front, and just keep going up the leg. until we reach a place where it will just tie nicely at the front. So here we go. We're going to tie that just in a knot there. And we will let the strap hang down. Now take the back straps, inside first, then the outside, around covering these first set of straps. Not everyone did this, but there is evidence that it was done. So let that one come down through and tie that a little lower than the top one. So it does a gap between them. And if that's not sitting down properly, hanging down, let's just push it through there and through there so that it hangs down nicely at the front of the foot. And there we have it. Now, not everybody, of course, was a Roman senator and had these red boots. Some of the ordinary citizens, they would have had black. And um, this has not had the straps attached at all, as you can see, it's just a black moccasin. But if I just remove the straps from the front of this, attach the black straps, which will scarcely be visible, but that'll make it correct. And then we have a calceus, a pair of calce for our Roman citizen. So here's an enormous variety of different kinds of footwear that were available in the Roman Empire. And hot weather, cold weather, wet weather, dry weather, there was always something. Why do Hollywood movies usually show Jesus Christ being crucified by Roman legionaries? And why do most people think that the Roman army was made entirely of legions? In fact, neither of these things is true. The military backbone of the Roman Empire certainly was in the legions. The legions were composed entirely of men with Roman citizenship. But a large part of the Roman army was made up of men from the provinces who were full-time professional soldiers but who did not have Roman citizenship. They were known as auxiliaries and were not organised in legions but in cohorts. So the soldiers at the crucifixion of Jesus were Roman auxiliaries. The question for drama on video or stage or film is did they look different? The answer is rather complicated, but for drama, I think the answer should definitely be yes. We associate the legions with the metal plate armour we call lorica segmentata. And the shield is curved but with straight edges. 
It's called a scutum. The auxiliaries wore chain mail called Lorica Harmata and carried a flat oval shield called a clipius. Here is a shield of the scutum type. Thank you, Murray. It's got a curved face. It's straight at the top and bottom and has straight edges. The handle is horizontal on the inside, so it's carried like that. And the front of the handle has a thing called an umbo, which is a shield boss to protect the hand. So that is a scutum. Now, the clippius, which was used by the auxiliaries, was like this. It's flat, oval, again an umbo in the centre, and again a horizontal uh, shield grip at the, on the inside. Now, neither of these shields uh, is made to museum replica quality, but on the other hand, I think they're perfectly good enough for film or stage. If you want beautiful pieces of armour, you can buy them. In the United States, I have bought items from niximperial.biz and in Europe from armai.com in France. But if you're on a low budget, armour made of steel and brass may be very expensive, so let me show you some alternatives. You may want to buy some and make some, and that's what I've done. Now here is the cord. You can buy this uh, cord from uh, Tobin's Lake Studios and they will give you full instructions on how to make chain mail out of this. You take a number 15 knitting needles and just knit very straightforward one row knit, one row purl, one row knit, <laughs> one row purl. And what you end up with is this. But remember, this is the front side. We're not interested in that. We're interested in the reverse side. So turn it around. That's what's going to become our chain mail. The first thing we need to do is to spray paint it black. It's matte black spray paint. And you need to spray it both sides. And that means going in, in several directions. Spray it this way, spray it that way, this way, that way. When it's dried, turn it over, same thing so that it's thoroughly black through and through. Then, this is the top, this is the bottom of our chain mail. Take silver stencil paint. Here's my stencil brush, which is flat topped. And don't want too much of this at a time. Just get the right amount. Sometimes it's good to dab it on some paper. And we're going to go from the top to the bottom. And it's really a matter of your own judgment as to just when you stop on that. I'll leave it at that. So there we've got a little bit of chain mail. Now, let me show you a whole piece. There we are. We've trimmed the front there with leather and added some ornaments there. There's a front piece, a back piece, they're joined together at the sides, that has to be done before painting, joined on the shoulders, this goes over, and what you have there is, in fact, what our model is wearing. Exactly the same thing. Now, let's come to helmets. Helmets changed with the passing years. During the New Testament period, the style of helmet underwent a change from what we call the Coolus helmet, there it is, made of bronze, very similar to brass. It changed from that to the Imperial Gallic and Imperial Italic helmets, which were made of iron. This is what our model is wearing. This helmet was a much more practical device and uh, it served the Roman legions and the Roman auxiliaries very well. Now, let's look at another one. This is an Attic helmet. And in drama, it's usually used as the helmet worn by senior officers. But its origins are Greek rather than Italian. And please, this kind of helmet was not worn by centurions. Centurions wore a helmet with a transverse crest. This gave them a bigger profile when they were charging into battle and their soldiers could see them more easily and follow them. 
On parade, the centurions wore phalerae decorations. The centurions wore their swords on the left side, which, as we shall see, was unusual, and they carried a vine stick as a symbol of rank and to beat their men. These helmets are metal, and you can get them from firms that supply Roman reenactment groups. You can find that quite easily on the web. But they're not cheap. There is an alternative, fortunately, and that's plastic. In the United States, I've been able to obtain kits made of white vinyl from Tobin's Lake Studios. On their website, click on Easy Armor. Tobin's Lake Studio not only do helmets, they do breastplates and weapons of various kinds. Let's have a look at some of them. Here, for example, is a sword. I think it looks quite nice. Let's see how this was made. We start with a large sheet of vinyl with several impressions made on it. This is one I've cut out with a preliminary cutout that's of a sword. What we do is we start with a pencil and I'm going to make at 45 degrees. Let's show that on the other side. Just about there. I'm going to need that pencil mark. There. Now I can cut it out and I've got a pencil mark to follow. So we cut out very carefully following on that line and now I see how much I need that line to follow. Now here is one that's been completely cut out. Here is the second half. But if I just stick them together like that, they'll be <laughs> too wobbly, they won't work. Get a piece of wood, put it in the middle, take glue, no hot glue guns, please. They will just melt everything. Just take some contact adhesive, and stick that in there. When that well stuck, then when that's firm, take the other half and stick it together. And you've got the weapon. Then you can spray paint that with matte black paint and then finish it with the colours to suit. Here's uh, another one that I made. Still quite firm, but it's been strengthened on the inside. Let's put those there. This one, as you can see, represents a sword in a scabbard complete, just ready for a person to wear. And let me show you how that worked out and how several of them worked out. Here's one that I've made up. This we had for one of Herod's soldiers. It's more of a Greek weapon in some ways. Uh, here's another. This is the one that you've been looking at here. and it's just been painted. Now, when we come to helmets, let me show you how that works. Same idea. This helmet is one that's already been almost completely assembled. And here is a cheek piece. That cheek piece will go in and we'll line it up probably just about, about there should do right. And the other cheek piece will be stuck on the other side. Spray paint that inside and out with matte black paint. The result is going to be a helmet like this. Now what about the finish? Everything's in the finish. I have found rather than painting these, I like to use an antique gold wax. This is called rub and buff and it's used for touching up picture frames. What I do is I just squeeze a little of the wax out of that onto my finger, so, and then I start rubbing in small circles. L lots of little small circles. Keep going. Not right into all the cracks because we want some of the uh, detail in the cracks to show. Like that. Now, after you've done that, take a soft cloth, a really soft cloth and smooth and polish that really hard and fast and you will find that comes up like a beautiful metal. There's only one problem with it and that is because it's a wax, if something else rubs against that, the gold is going to come off 
and onto the other object. And I found a way around that too. I use acrylic spray varnish, just a clear varnish, an acrylic spray, and just spray the whole helmet, very thin coat, not, don't let it run. And what you find it comes with, this is another helmet with a different kind of uh, style, but it's the same finish. Now, this helmet, we used for King Herod soldiers because they were not Roman soldiers. And in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, this kind of a shape seems to have been quite popular. So we used that for Herod soldiers. We had quite a number of other kinds as well. This represents a Greek style helmet of the Hellenistic period, the period after Alexander and up to the uh, first century before Christ. Certainly in the second century, whoops, leave that one there. And here's another one which uh, we've painted and I've attached bits and pieces from other, from other helmets and we've made that up to look very good for one of Herod's officers. So, there you have the way to do helmets. In this scene, the helmets, the breastplates, the swords are all made of vinyl. Are these items right for Romans? Well, for the Roman army, not really. But for King Herod soldiers? We don't know exactly what they looked like. So something like this, which fits the general period and with the Eastern helmets, works well enough. In the Roman army, infantry soldiers, except the centurions, wore their swords on the right side and a dagger on the left. Soldiers wore two belts, one for the sword, the other for the dagger. Now, let me show you that in some detail. When there were two belts, the belts were fairly narrow and they had bronze metal plates on them. This is an exact replica, including a Roman buckle. The dagger has, as you see, four rings and straps went through this to hang it. Now, if I take this belt through the back, and pull that through, there it is, ready to hang on one side. With the sword, it's very much the same. Here is the sword in the scabbard. Here are straps through the four rings. And the belt goes through. And there's the sword hanging on that side. So, when both of these were put on together, the appearance was like this. Cross belts, sort of cowboy style, but instead of guns, on one side we've got the dagger, and on the other side, the sword. In this case, as this is slightly earlier, about the time of Augustus, the helmet is the coolest style which was used then. But we can equip this man now as a Roman auxiliary. There is a shield of the Clippius type, and we take a spear because auxiliaries, but not legionaries, used spears. So now we have the kind of soldier who would have been present perhaps at the crucifixion of Jesus. The blade varied from time to time. Excuse me. This is called a Mainz pattern, named after Mainz in Germany, where the first example was found. It's uh, of the Augustan period, slightly wasted in the blade here, and a long tapering point. On the other hand, a later type is this one, which we call the Pompeian pattern, because the first example was found in Pompeii, where the blade has parallel edges, and then the tapering is uh, not, not quite so elongated. Later in the empire, exactly when we're not quite sure, a change was made and the dagger was hung from suspenders and then the sword hung on a baldric which was a strap going across the shoulders. And so the sword was held that way. Centurions had a different kind of belt again. They had a wide belt and then the sword on a baldric, the dagger would be hung from a small belt. A very important item to remember is the sandals. Military sandals. The Romans called them caligae. They're similar to the style we've seen as crepidae. Very narrow loops with a threading going between them 
and with hobnails on the soles. The uh, hobnails were important. They gave a good grip on the ground. During the fall of Jerusalem, which was a terrible, horrible event, there was a Roman centurion who got into the temple area and he was chasing a group of Jewish rebels. And as he was chasing, he was so big, this fellow, so powerful, so strong, so heavily armoured, they were terrified of him and ran away. And as they were running in the temple across the marble, they heard a crash behind them. The soldier had skidded with the hobnails on the marble floor and gone crashing down. Because of his armour and weapons, he couldn't get up quickly. So they turned around, pounced on him and finished him off. If you're staging a passion play, you may want to include temple guards. We know they were a kind of Jewish police force controlled by the priests for the city of Jerusalem and the temple area. But what did they look like? <laughs> really, we have almost nothing to go on and no idea. I started with a plain dark brown or dark grey tunic. Some costumiers would prefer a longer tunic and that's fine, perhaps better. For our videos, we gave them scale armour, what the Romans called lorica squamata. The shape of this particular one is more Greek than Roman, but that's fine for the Jewish people in that place at that time. If you can't afford the metal, and that is expensive, there are other ways to do it. What I did here is I simply took some uh, plastic, a kind of a flexible stuff, and cut out some gold scales and then stapled or stuck them onto a backing and gave them a bit of paint over the top to darken them down a little. Same kind of a thing here uh, with a silver finish. They could be card or anything like that. And then again, a bit of black spray paint and that helped with that. But there's another alternative. This is made of vinyl. It's from Tobin's Lake Studios. You cut it out and paint it in the way we've described. It doesn't have the flexibility, but it looks quite acceptable. There is no back to this, so you have to tie it on with straps around the back and make holes for that. And that means in turn that you need a cloak to cover the back. Now, in our model, he's wearing a cloak anyway. You'll see that we have fastened it with a brooch on the right shoulder, leaving the right arm free for action. Let me just Stop for a moment there, I'll explain what I mean. When we were doing the Romans wearing togas or Greeks wearing hemations, we have them over the left shoulder, under the right arm, to leave the right arm free for action. The same is true, but in a different way, for military cloaks. There, the cloak is fastened on the right shoulder with a brooch, leaving that right arm free, and then is thrown over the left, uh, the left shoulder. The sword is from Tobin's Lake Studios too, made out of vinyl, uh, put together, stuck together and then painted. The shield. What I did is I took a clippius type shield, that is a flat Roman shield as would be used by an auxiliary, and I simply gave it a sort of leathery look and then painted some Jewish devices on it. The menorah here at the top, a typically Jewish device, I drew it first, then made my own stencil out of a piece of plastic, cut it out, painted it, and then I can use that again on another shield. For the uh, palm branches, which were a Jewish symbol of victory, um, I took a long piece of plastic, cut out the palm branch, put it on here, painted it, took it off, cleaned the stencil very thoroughly, turned it over and used the reverse side to get the pa an identical palm branch on the other side of the shield. And I think it all worked together quite well. Now, what about helmets? Again, we don't know. This one is fanciful, and I admit it, I'll come back to that in a moment. 
Tobin's Lake Studios do provide an Eastern Roman helmet, as typical of the way a Roman auxiliary helmets were for particularly archers in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, and this would work very well for helmets for temple guards. Excellent. My problem was that I'd used these already for the soldiers of King Herod. So I didn't want to use exactly the same helmet for the temple guards, and I had to come up with something else. So what I did was very simple. Took a basic Roman shape in plastic, modelled a, uh, a pomegranate, because pomegranates were part of temple ornamentation and architecture, so I, I modelled that, put that on the top, and when I'd finished it, I put a bit of a, a turban around the outside. That is probably incorrect historically having the turban outside the helmet but it gives us an oriental look for a popular drama and i think it looks acceptable so if you want to use temple guards in your drama just understand a little bit of what the romans did a bit of what the greeks did and then some jewish history and combine it in some way and i don't think anybody can prove you wrong because nobody knows what they looked like <laughs>
A much older book that I've used is Ancient Greek, Roman and Byzantine Costume and Decoration by Mary Houston, published by Adam and Charles Black in London. The first edition of this book was published in 1931, and the second was in 1947. And knowledge of Greek and Roman costume has advanced considerably since then, so it's very dated material. And remember, Mary Houston describes Greek costume, but for the most part, she's writing about classical Greece and not the New Testament period. Pictures are always useful. And there are several books by Peter Connolly that include a few pictures of costume. Living in the Time of Jesus of Nazareth from Oxford University Press, 1983. This is also available in America, but under a different title. It's called The Jews in the Time of Jesus, a History. But it's the same book. For Roman army information, the best book I have on helmets and body armour is this one. It's called The Armour of Imperial Rome by Russell Robinson. He was the uh, curator of arms and armour in the Tower of London in England. It's published by Arms and Armour Press in 1975. Very hard to obtain, but a very good book. A useful book with lots of photographs, uh, reconstructions of Roman legions, is by Daniel Peterson. It's published by Crowwood Press, 1992, simply called The Roman Legions. The Osprey Men-at-Arms series on military history has the Roman army from Caesar to Trajan by Michael Simkins, illustrated by Ron Embleton, published in 1984. There are several books in this series. There's another one, The Praetorian Guard, in the Elite series, about the Praetorians who were the guards guarding the emperor in Rome. As someone said, if who guards the guards. Um, Rome's Enemies, number five, The Desert Frontier, is another useful book in this series. Again, Peter Connolly has written and illustrated a nice book on this, The Roman Army, published by MacDonald Educational in 1975. Warfare in the Classical World is written by John Worry and published by Salamander Books, 1980. All of these are useful. But if you want to see some of the costumes that we've used here in actual stories from the Bible, then there are several DVDs from IMM. For example, uh, the series People Who Met Jesus, series one and series two. And then there's a book, there's a video, a DVD, on the parables of Jesus and another one on the path of Jesus. And these are available. Why not get in touch with IMM? IMM.edu. I hope your Bible drama is wonderfully successful and that what you've seen here will help to make it so. God bless you. Music